82. The next morning, when he managed to get up, July came into the kitchen to find Cholo sharpening a thin bladed knife. The baby lay on the table, kicking his bare feet, and Clara, wearing a man's hat, was giving the two girls instructions. Don't feed him just because he hollers, she said. Feed him when it's time. She looked at July, who felt embarrassed. He was not sick, and yet he felt as weak as if he had had a long fever. A plate with some cold eggs on it and a bit of bacon sat on the table, his breakfast no doubt. Being the last one up made him feel a burden. Cholo stood up. It was clear he and Claire were contemplating some work. July knew he ought to offer to help, but his legs would barely carry him to the table. He couldn't understand it. He had long since been over his jaundice, and yet he had no strength. We've got to gild some horses, Clara said. We've put it off too long, hoping Bob would get back on his feet. I hate it when you do that, Sally said. You'd hate it worse if we had a bunch of studs running around here, Clara said. One of them might crack your head, just like that Mustang cracked your father's. She paused by the table a minute and tickled one of the baby's feet. I'd like to help, July said. You don't look that vigorous, she said. I'm not sick, July said. I must have slept too hard. I expect you did something too hard, she said. Stay and make conversation with these girls. That's harder work than gelding horses. July liked the girls, though he had not said much to them. They seemed fine girls to him, always chattering. Mostly they fought over who got to tend the baby. Clara and Cholo left, and July slowly ate his breakfast, feeling guilty. Then he remembered what had happened. Ellie was gone, into Indian country. He had to go after her as soon as he ate. The baby, still on the table, gurgled at him. July had scarcely looked at it, though it seemed a good baby. Clara wanted it, the girls fought over it, and yet Ellie had left it. Thinking about it made him more confused. After breakfast, he got his rifle, but instead of leaving, he walked down to the lots. Every now and then he heard the squeal of a young horse. Walking, he didn't feel quite so weak, and it occurred to him that he ought to try and be some help. He could start after Ellie later. It was hot, and the young horses were kicking up dust in the lots. To his surprise, he saw that Clara was doing the cutting while the old man held the ropes. It was hard work. The horses were strong, and they badly needed another man. July quickly climbed into the lots and helped the old man anchor the hind legs of a quivering young bay. Clara paused a moment, wiping the sweat off her forehead with her shirt tail. Her hands were bloody. Shouldn't one of us do it? July asked. No, Cholo said. She's better. Bob taught me, Clara said. We didn't have any help when we first came here. I wasn't strong enough to hold the horses, so I got stuck with the messier job. They gilded 15 young horses and left them in the pen where they could be watched. July had stopped feeling weak, but even so, it was a wonder to him how hard Clara and the old man worked. They didn't stop the rest until the job was done, by which time they were all soaked with sweat. Clara splashed water out of the horse trough to wash her hands and forearms and immediately started toward the house. I hope those worthless girls have been cooking, she said. I've built an appetite. Do you know anything about the Indian situation? July asked. I know Red Cloud, Clara said. Bob was good to him. They lived on our horses that hard winter we had four years ago. They couldn't find buffalo. I heard they're dangerous, July said. Yes, Clara said. Red Cloud's fed up. Bob treated them fair, and we've never had to fear them. I was more scared as a girl. The Comanches would come right into Austin and take children. I always dreamed they'd get me, and I'd have red babies. July had never felt so irresolute. He ought to go, yet he didn't. Though he had worked hard, he had little appetite, and after the meal spent more time cleaning his gun than was really necessary. When he finished, he set the rifle against the porch railing telling himself that he would get up and leave. But before he could get up, Clara walked out on the porch with no warning at all and put the baby into his hands. She practically dropped the child into his lap, an act July felt was very reckless. He had to catch him. That's a good sign, Clara said. At least you'd catch him if somebody threw him off a roof. The baby stared at July with wide eyes, as surprised, evidently, as he was. July looked at Clara, who seemed angry. I think it's time you take a look at him, she said. He's your boy. He might come to like you, 
in which case he'll bring you more happiness than that woman ever will. He needs you a slight more than she does, too. July felt scared he would do something wrong with the baby. He was also a little scared of Clara. I don't know anything about babies, he said. No, and you've never lived any place but Arkansas, Clara said. But you ain't stupid and you ain't nailed down. You can live other places and you can learn about children. People dumber than you learn about them. Again, July felt belabored by the tireless thing in Clara. Ellie might not look at him, but she didn't pursue him relentlessly with words as Clara did. Stay here, she said. Do you hear me? Stay here. Martin needs a paw and I could use a good hand. If you go trailing after that woman, either the Indians will kill you or that buffalo hunter will, or you'll just get lost and starve. It's a miracle you made it this far. You don't know the plains, and I don't believe you know your wife either. How long did you know her before you married? July tried to remember. The trial in Missouri had lasted three days, but he had met Ellie nearly a week before that. Two weeks, I guess, he said. That short acquaintance, Clara said. The smartest man alive can't learn much about a woman in two weeks. Well, she wanted to marry, July said. It was all he could remember about it. Ellie had made it clear she wanted to marry. That could have been another way of saying she wanted to change a scene, Clara said. People get a hankering to quit what they're doing. They think they want to try something else. I do it myself. Half the time I think I'd like to pack up these girls and go live with my aunt in Richmond, Virginia. Well, what would you do there, July asked. I might write books, Clara said. I have a hankering to try it. But then it'll come a pretty morning and I'll see the horses grazing and think how I'd miss them. So I doubt I'll get off to Richmond. Just then, the baby began to cry, squirming in his hands. July looked at Clara, but she made no effort to take the baby. July didn't know what to do. He was afraid he might drop the child, who twisted in his hands like a rabbit and yelled so loud he turned red as a beet. Is he sick? July asked. No, he's fine, Clara said. Maybe he's telling you off for ignoring him all this time. I wouldn't blame him. With that, she turned and went back into the house, leaving him with the baby, who at once began to cry even harder. July hoped one of the girls would come out and help, but neither seemed to be around. It seemed very irresponsible of Clara to simply leave him with the child. He felt that she was not a very helpful woman, but then Ellie hadn't been that helpful either. He was afraid to stand up with the baby squirming so he might drop him, so he sat wondering why in the world people wanted children. How could anyone know what a baby wanted or what to do for them? But as abruptly as he had started, the baby stopped crying. He whimpered a time or two, stuck his fist in his mouth, and then simply stared at July again as he had at first. July was so relieved that he scarcely moved. Talk to him a little, Clara said. She stood in the door behind him. What do you say? She made a snort of disgust. Introduce yourself if you can't think of nothing else, she said, or sing him a song. He's sociable. He likes a little talk. July looked at the baby but couldn't think of a song. Can you even hum? Clara asked, as if it were a crime he had not immediately started singing. July remembered a saloon song he had always liked, Lorena. He tried humming a little bit of it. The baby, who had been wiggling, stopped at once and looked at him solemnly. July felt silly humming, but since it calmed the baby, he kept on. He was holding the baby almost at arm's length. Put him against your shoulder, Clara said. You don't have to hold him like that. He ain't a newspaper. July tried it. The baby soon wet his shirt with slobbers, but he wasn't crying. July continued to hum Lorena. Then, to his relief, Clara took the baby. That's progress, she said. Rome wasn't built in a day. Dusk came and July didn't leave. He sat on the porch, his rifle across his lap, trying to make up his mind to go. He knew he ought to. However difficult she was, Ellie was still his wife. She might be in danger, and it was his duty to try to save her. If he didn't go, he would be given up forever. He might even never know if she had lived or died. He didn't want to be the kind of man who would just let his wife blow out of his life like a weed, and yet that's what he was doing. 
He felt too tired to do otherwise. Even if the Indians didn't get him, or them, even if he didn't get lost in the plains, he might just find her in some other room and have her turn her face away again. Then what? She could go on running, and he would go on chasing until something really bad happened. When Clary came out again to call him to supper, he felt worn out from thinking. He almost flinched when he heard Clara's step, for he had a feeling she was ill-disposed toward him and might have something sharp to say. Again, he was wrong. She walked down the steps and paused to watch three cranes flying across the sunset along the silver path of the plate. Ain't they great birds, she said quietly. I wonder which I'd miss most, them or the horses, if I was to move away. July didn't suppose she would move away. She'd seen so much of the place that it didn't seem likely. After watching the bird, she looked at him as if just noticing that he was still there. Are you willing to stay? she asked. July had rather she hadn't asked. Rather, it had been something that just happened. He didn't feel he had made a decision, and yet he hadn't left. I guess I oughtn't to chase her, he finally said. I guess I ought to let her be. It doesn't do to sacrifice for people unless they want you to, Clara said. It's just a waste. Ma, it's getting cold, Betsy said from the doorway. I was just enjoying the summer for a minute, Clara said. Well, you're always telling me how much you hate to serve cold food, Betsy said. Clara looked at her daughter for a moment and then went up the steps. Come on, July, she said. These girls mean to see that we keep our standards. Put the rifle back in the saddle scabbard and followed her into the house. (laughs) 